I guess what I have to say about Bitcoin is Bitcoin represents it, it is matter and energy and cyberspace. Mm -hmm. That's the big idea we ought to focus on. And we ought to be sending that message to all engineers everywhere that. That without Bitcoin, uh, you don't have matter or energy in cyberspace and everything that exists in the in the internet domain and the digital domain is merely a simulation or a model of something mm -hmm. in the real world the significance of you know being able to transfer something of value without an intermediary means that if, if i can transfer it to you without an intermediary, I can instantiate it or, or I can manifest it without an intermediary. And that means it stands alone in cyberspace rather than being an image of something that is in the real world. The image in the real world makes it a security. Uh, whereas when you actually manifest the actual unit, the Satoshi in the digital realm, it is matter. I, I can create something of substance uh, in the digital realm using Bitcoin. And if that's the case, then that, that introduces the field of engineering and physics into cyberspace. And that's what's been missing in, in the entire digital realm. The digital realm for the past 30 years <clears throat> lacked matter and energy, and you just had simulations. Uh, and that meant that um, computer science might have been relevant, but all the other sciences were never relevant. Like... All of the all of the learnings in mechanical engineering and civil engineering and thermodynamics and physics and material science and aeronautical engineering, all of those insights they're not they're not relevant if there's no matter and no energy mm -hmm. in the digital realm. So, they said, why was Satoshi so fascinated by irreversible transactions? But my thought was, yeah, Satoshi wanted irreversible transactions, but the idea for irreversible transactions came from the great almighty when the universe yes. was created. Yes. Right? Because, you know, in the beginning, you know, let there be light, right? In the beginning, there was nothing, and then there was light. Well, light is energy. So the first thing that happens is energy and then from and matter is energy and time flows in the beginning right before time flew be, before time there was nothing so what happens well when when you actually introduce the concept of irreversibility you introduce entropy mm -hmm. and time progression of time is the progression of disorder and they're inextricably intertwined and matter and energy are inextricably intertwined and bitcoin is like that big bang mm -hmm. and in the big bang you know in the beginning right there was nothing and then all of a sudden the time chain starts to form and there's irreversibility and now there's the passage of time And now there's there's electricity run through the SHA-256 protocol to become digitized energy, a, a digital asset. And the beauty of the protocol was it was introduced as a conservative protocol, not an open-ended protocol. 
the universe has a bound of 21 million. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and because we had that, we had uh, for the first time this this sort of bearer instrument that represents energy that's conservative. And if I can transfer it to myself, to yourself without an intermediary, then I can instantiate it. And if I can instantiate it, I, it, I can persist it. The ability to persist energy without an intermediary is what allowed us to cut the cord with the banks. Now the money flowing over the internet wasn't, wasn't um, a reflection. It wasn't a shadow of the money in the Visa network. It wasn't a shadow of the money in a bank. Everything was shadows of the real thing until Satoshi and now we actually have the real thing, also known as, uh, you know, reif reified information, but reified, just a fancy word for objective, you know, an object, right? Um, so you could say it's materialized information, or you could say it was dematerialized energy, which is the, the opposite way to say the same thing. So if you're focused upon matter and, and matter is relevant because matter is conservative, then the most extraordinary thing is the creation of matter in cyberspace. Now I can construct a billion dollar structure in cyberspace apart from any institution or individual, right? You could literally release the thing in cyberspace and it can live on its own. You want to, you, you could, in theory, create some kind of program, an AI program that was wealthy, that could live forever with assets or with wealth that is uh, completely separate from any, any physical counterparty. Mm -hmm. So things that are beautiful are things in nature that are beyond the reach of politics. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so a politician can't stop the force of gravity. People say, you know, why would I ever want to have an irreversible transaction? Well, like when you drop a rock off a, off a cliff, it's irreversible transaction. Mm -hmm. Why would you want to have it? Well, because every machine works based upon those principles, right? If I want to build a dam, I need to know that the water always flows downhill and that no politician is going to cause the water to flow uphill randomly, you know, per code because it breaks the dam. You can't build a mechanism uh, without, um, without, uh, energy and matter and natural law and no political intervention. And that means if there is no matter in cyberspace, then nothing you do in, ma in cyberspace matters. matters. Yeah. And that's why you get, that's why you get 180 million fake accounts on Twitter every year because nothing matters. And uh, that's why you get all the garbage and the spam and the phishing attacks and, and the toxicity because nothing matters. There's nothing unhealthy in nature because nature recycles every unhealthy thing very quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can't create a mechanism without matter and energy. And the velocity when you go to irreversible and matter and energy is going to go to a kilohertz or 10 kilohertz or a thousand kilohertz. And so it's not like 10 X better or hundred X better or a thousand X better. I, 
everything we built in cyberspace, right? They're shadows of reality. And as much as we tell ourselves we built something functional, it's a, it, what is it? It's like, it's a grotesque, it's a grotesque monstrosity of something functional. Mm -hmm. Fake because there's no consequences, there's no matter, there's no energy. So we create things that have the appearance of functionality, but they're not truly beautiful and they're not functional. And uh, if we actually take this to the next extreme, consider, consider all the buildings in the world constructed with steel. Now take away all the steel and consider what the world looks like. Now consider all the structures in cyberspace built without Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Nothing beautiful. Every, you know, everything twisted and perverted in some way, shape or form. Now, now imagine we introduce a crypto steel, this thing we call Bitcoin digital, you know, we run machines in cyberspace on digital energy and we build uh, walls and buildings and structures and fortresses in cyberspace with digital matter. And uh, now for the first time, there are consequences and things do matter. And what, what beautiful machines will we make? And, uh, and what kind of, you know, toxic garbage will we purge mm -hmm. from the system? The problem is we just don't have uh, the right materials working in the digital realm. Way too much focus on proof of stake networks and like 19,800 coins. You know, and I look at all of it and, and I, you know, I'm hard pressed to see, but just endless recursive financial engineering. Right. Like if I if I stream sats by the second or by or by the millisecond, it's literally like shining sunshine. Sunshine is light. Sats are energy, like quanta of energy. And what it's like if you enter a burning building, if you go into a burning building in the real world, you would walk in and then it's going to get hot. And then at some point you're going to start to burn. And then eventually you'll be dead. Right? That's consequence, a burning building. Can you create a burning building in cyberspace? You can create sunshine in cyberspace, or you can create a fire in cyberspace. You can create a heat sink. You can create a wall. You can rip down the wall. Mm -hmm. you, can, uh, you can create any number of structures and, and you can implement the structures with the frequency that's machine speed. So you could create very intricate mechanisms that might run a million times faster than a physical mechanism that have friction, friction and consequence and, and, and uh, they exchange kinetic energy and potential energy and you What if I put uh, $50,000 worth of Bitcoin into the car, in the chip? And then what if the Bitcoin ran through a exchange and then it ran through a electric power provider and the car was just continually replenished off of the Bitcoin for the life of the car? I could, I could build a power source into the car. What if, I, what if I built it into anything? What if I built it into the house? Well, what if I create a perpetual annuity, but I do it with Bitcoin and then I attach it to a piece, a piece of hardware. You could attach it to a hardware wallet, right? I mean, like. 
So for about 2,000 years, maybe 3,000 years, people were pretty much stuck and you could endlessly re-engineer and attempt to improve things, but the materials are the limiting factor. When steel comes along, now you can reimagine 10 story, 20 story, 40 story buildings, you combine steel with, you know, the concept of, um, of an elevator or the like with a little bit of electricity. And, uh, and now the entire world of civil engineering explodes with a mm -hmm. renaissance of creativity. And so materials hold back a given field. Steel was an important material. Oil, you know, if, if you calculate the energy density of oil and compare it to coal or compare it to wind, right? Sorry, you put aluminum together with diesel and you get the airplane. And you take away those two things, right? No internal combustion engine, no, no oil or, and, and no, uh, no aluminum, no steel, the civilization disappears. <clears throat> so I've used the metaphor of crypto steel, right? Bitcoin really is that crypto steel. It's not just digital energy, it's digital matter, but it's a very particular type of matter. It's, it's a tough enough matter that you could build something that you could reasonably expect to layer What do I want? I want the building to last a hundred years, but I also want it to be a hundred stories high. Mm -hmm. And a hundred stories high is working against gravity, right? And if you think about the the energy and gravity on the hundredth story versus the first, you know, the first level of the building, you needed some kind of material that had enormous energy density, metallic energy, and steel is the highest density. Um, metallic form of energy or the most powerful metallic energy. But if you ever walked into a steel refinery and you looked at how they created it, there would be no doubt in your mind, a lot of energy goes into it. Mm -hmm. Extraordinary energy goes into it in order to, in order to create that material. So I think if we if we look forward in the coming age, uh, the human race is is held back by lack of certain materials. And when you find the material, then um, you can leap forward and you can break through all of these constraints. And uh, we have not even scratched the surface. There must be 10,000 different areas that you can reimagine with Bitcoin as the material. We are. If I take the billion dollars of electricity and instead I sell it for a billion dollars of political energy, we call dollars, then I trade the political energy for digital energy we call Bitcoin, and I have a billion dollars of Bitcoin, the Bitcoin is a file. I have transformed analog energy into digital energy. Now, when I move the file from me to you, I lose it, you have it. And the difference between that file and a digital music file is the music is not conservative and the Bitcoin is conservative. And so when I sent you the music file, I kept the copy. But when I send you the Bitcoin, there's no double spend. I lost the copy. So, and you transform them into different types of energy. Eventually, you're gonna, you'll probably flip through a political energy we call fiat currency, and then you'll convert that. These are heat exchanges or energy exchanges, right? Mm -hmm. You're just transforming one, one type of energy to another. What is vibration? Vibration literally is the transformation of energy from one form to another form. Pendulum, 
This is potential energy. This is kinetic, kinetic. energy. Yeah. Potential kinetic. I, I, it's continually with a sine wave vibrating, just like that guitar is vibrating. Potential energy to kinetic energy. When you're, when you're vibrating energy between the dollar and the Bitcoin and back to the dollar and into electricity and back to the Bitcoin, you're just, you're just vibrating it. And you've got a little bit of energy loss, but not that much. And if, it's, and if there's not very much energy loss, you get a resonating frequency. You know, you strike something and it'll, it'll actually hum right forever right a long long time and the reason you transform them digitally is so that you can vibrate them at any frequency and store them uh with no uh degradation right move them in a friction free programmatic fashion and store them forever right I can't store my oil or my electricity forever. And I can't program it, decompose it, recompose it, and oscillate or vibrate it. And uh, that's why I want it digital. But as soon as you break that idea and you realize that once you've digitally transformed it, uh, then um, the sky's the limit. Because at that point, you can write programs and machines that do 10 million things an hour with it. You can you can decompose it and vibrate it, you know, in different forms between a, a hundred thousand counterparties in an hour. I mean, who knows where that leads? And when when we convert physical energy and physical matter to digital energy and digital matter in cyberspace, it's weightless. Digital energy is about putting energy into orbit. It's about putting something real into cyberspace. And the profound idea is if, if you can create digital energy, you can create digital matter. If you can create digital matter, you can create something that matters. Mm -hmm. And now the passage of time and, and the onset of entropy allows you to construct something in the digital realm, which is orders of magnitude better than what we have today. And so the most fundamental thing to understand about Bitcoin is if we're going to improve the economy, if we're going to create an ethical monetary asset and a trustworthy, technically sound, economically sound, ethically sound monetary network, you're going to have to do it in a fashion that doesn't require, nor does it allow the intervention of a company, an individual, a group of programmers, a country, a politician. Right. It needs to be beyond a shadow of a doubt. Now, nobody in China thinks that an American politician can make their steel building collapse by passing a law in America. That's why they use steel. And that's why we universally use steel to build beautiful things. And so when you're talking to politicians or investors and they say, why energy? It's, it's because we're trying to engineer a better world. And you can't engineer a better physical world without physical energy and physical matter. If you want to engineer a virtual world, put on your virtual goggles, put on music, you know, and stare at some avatar and never take them off 
And then software might solve that problem, but it's certainly not going to solve the problem that the human race has and is going to have for the next 10,000 years. And we need to do the one thing that human beings have always done in order to elevate their condition. And that one thing is to channel energy. We will either channel energy and prosper as a nation, as a civilization, as a people, or we will fail to channel energy and we will suffer. Ultimately, it's the channeling of energy that determines the winners from the losers. And our best hope to uplift all of the civilization, all of humanity, is to channel energy more effectively. And, uh, and money is the last great engineering feat Hmm. for us to move to the next stage. If you're looking for the great breakthroughs in channeling economic energy, you had coinage, followed by banknotes, followed by credit, and here we are. None of those previous systems for channeling economic energy, you know, would be deemed by an engineer to be anywhere near acceptable. Except. Any machine that lost two, three, five, ten percent of its energy every cycle would have been discarded as <laughs> as a prototype. This is digital energy technology. Digital energy, digital money, digital commodities, they're critical to embrace, and especially digital scarcity to the future of the human race. Yeah, Bitcoin miner, it's a machine uh, to create security in cyberspace. You're putting electricity in and you're creating a, a vault of encrypted energy. Uh, uh, and that's what you're using uh, to build uh, as your foundation uh, to build uh, civilization in cyberspace. Right. And, and uh, in this particular case, I see the Bitcoin miners as the foundation to hold up the entire the entire digital ecosystem. Steel is ma is a mat uh, material energy. It's massively dense energy, and if you want to build structures, you have to create the steel. I think about a steel refinery and I think about how much energy goes into the refining of steel and the, the heat and the, and the, uh, the energy. And then you think about what comes out. And then if you want to build any structure in the world, right, that steel is the material to build that structure. Bitcoin miners are energy refiners in a way, right? And what they spit out is digital energy. They, they not, not only create it, but they secure it. You can also think of them as, you know, as uh, supporting the railroad in cyberspace, right? 
Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's a railroad and uh, there's a fixed cost to build the railroad and, and there's a fixed cost to maintain the railroad. But, but once you've got the railroad and it's properly maintained, now the cost to move tons of cargo from one end of the line to the other end of the line has decreased not by a factor of 10 or a factor of 100. It's probably decreased by a factor of 10,000 to 100,000. Where you're able to move... Uh, move material at orders and orders of magnitude less cost. The problem we have right now is although the world wants to be digital, there is no digital money. There is only digital credit. Remember what I said, money without energy is credit. Mm. And so right now, what you have is credit circulating on the digital network. Is the underlying asset, the euro, the dollar, the peso, their credit? And they're, and they're not backed by energy, which means that they're all lapsing in energy content anywhere from 10% a year to 50% a year to 90% a year. So over time, the entire system is collapsing because there's no there's no energy backing it and and it's neither a commodity nor is it a scarcity you're um converting the coupon into a commodity upgrading it to a scarcity so you're setting up an energy system that will hold money without energy lapse forever and will move it millions of times or billions of times more efficiently. The, the whole premise that is required for the universe to function is conservation of energy. You know, if, first, first you have to have the existence of energy, and then you have to have the conservation of energy. And, uh, you know, in the Bible, the first thing we remember is God says, let there be light. Right. That So everything starts with... Uh, with the deity pointing out that in the absence of light, which is energy, there is no life. So energy is, is fundamental, but conservation of energy is what makes the universe rational. It's what makes it work. Commodities by the energy are coupons. In cyberspace, you know, um, something, an object without energy is an image. If you have an object and it has no energy, it's like Plato's shadow. You know, a person without energy is a ghost. Um, when you make a comment 
it and there's no energy to back it, it lacks credibility. The energy itself is what creates cost to a copy. And uh, having a cost to a copy is what creates scarcity. The ultimate coupon is there's 21 million units of money and you can't make any more um if i uh if i want to guarantee that uh that it'll be scarce then i inject energy into each coupon right that's the equivalent 21 million gold coins it's not perfect, but it's uh, it's energy infused, so there's some expense to it. So it's uh, credible. But if I want to make it perfect, then I have to come up with a decentralized ledger or Bitcoin type system where it's not just 21 million gold coins, it's 21 million Bitcoin and no one can mine any more Bitcoin no matter how much energy they expend. So. So in that case, I go from I go from digital coupon when I have no energy to digital commodity when I have energy and if I want to become digital scarcity, I have to have uh, a digital protocol or a scarcity protocol that the energy circulates within. So the real genius of Bitcoin there is you haven't created a coupon, you haven't even created a digital commodity you've created a digital scarcity due to the protocol and the digital scarcity created absolute scarcity that's fixed. And because you created an absolute fixed scarcity, you created um, the perfect money and, and the ideal investment. Now, uh, people can start to act rationally. When you look at the, the fundamental breakthroughs with Bitcoin, one of them is solving the double spend problem. And the second is solving the problem of how you transfer a Bitcoin without a trusted intermediary, without a trusted third party. But if you think more deeply about this, solving the double spend problem is the same as solving the problem of conservation of energy in the universe. The entire last 30 years of the internet is all about uh, digital transformation of information and digital maps and digital music and digital entertainment. These are all examples of non-conservative bearer instruments moving through cyberspace. What do you get? Well, you get an explosion of information, an explosion of entertainment, an explosion of education, all good things. But they are not energy because they are not conservative. All matter, everything in the universe is energy, right? And matter can be converted to energy. Energy can be converted into matter. Tesla said, if you want to understand the secret to the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration.
you have to start thinking about vibration and energy and frequency, right? That's the significance of Bitcoin. decode the file and if i gave you a billion dollars worth of bitcoin in a file you would probably travel somewhere in the world and find an exchange or a person even if there was no exchange you would go find someone that owned a building and you would just swap them the bitcoin for the building directly in a peer-to-peer -peer transaction so bitcoin is digital energy because it is non-conservative and because it can get work done just like energy can get work done and also because it can be converted into matter or property the, the adiabatic lapse the energy lapse in the fluid as the energy moves through it and when you understand money like that then you understand the currencies are just fluids through which monetary money or monetary energy can flow. Money is economic energy. What is capital? Right? Ca capital is the concept of pure economic energy. How do you maintain the capital? Well, if you put it in a weak currency, it goes away. You put it in a strong property, it actually accretes or holds its value. So what is Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin's digital gold, but it's also digital property. It's also digital money. It's also digital capital. It's also digital energy. Um, if Bitcoin is digital energy, then I can create radiation in cyberspace. If I want your attention, I shine the light right in cyberspace. No one ever thought to do that with currency, but the, the closest equivalent would be I shower money on your head, right? I drop coins on your head. I throw pennies at you. But it's not very practical to throw pennies at people and, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't work. It's very practical to actually radiate Satoshis at people. But what, what we have now with Bitcoin, once you properly understand it, once you, once you see that it is truly a block of energy, it's it's moving at low frequency on the base layer, but it moves extremely high frequency on a layer two or a layer three. I would say if you're a technologist today and you're thinking about creating the next great thing, you ought to be thinking about how you create applications of digital energy. Right. This is not ideology, right? This is just technology. That's the old way. This is the new. One last point that I think is really important, which is Einstein said matter is energy and energy is matter. So is is bitcoin digital money yeah is it digital property yeah is it digital energy yeah now you've got digital energy now your inflation rate zero now you can hold it for a thousand years you can move it a, you can send it a thousand times transaction fee is next to nothing And you're like, well, but, but how's it digital energy? How do you get it back to be energy? And the answer is, okay, I send a billion dollar block of it to Tokyo. I run it through an exchange. Heat exchanger? Decoder? No, I run it through a Bitcoin exchange and I convert it back into yen and I take the yen and I buy electricity from the Tokyo Power Company. 
And when do I do that? Whenever I want to do that. But as long as there's a civilization that can produce electrical energy, I can exchange the digital energy for fiat energy. What's fiat? Uh, currency is, is political energy. What's clear is the civilization is built on top of energy system. Aluminum, steel, oil, these are all just forms of energy. Yes, yes, like human civilization is all about harnessing energy. And now we have Bitcoin, and what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is digital energy. And it, what makes it energy as opposed to property? Well, if I create a billion dollar digital hotel and I can move it at the speed of light, it's digital property, it's indestructible. But the thing that makes it energy is the fact that I can rent the hotel out by the room minute. We only have discovered um, one way that is settled and universally agreed upon to create digital energy or a digital commodity. And the one way is proof of work. I'd say uh, Bitcoin's an example of the creation of a digital commodity. So the use of energy doesn't guarantee that something is a commodity. The use of proof of work doesn't guarantee it's a scarcity. Right, because the protocol ha ha is what makes it a scarcity. The way that it becomes without an issuer is you have to have a consensus mechanism that doesn't require the coordination of engineers. So the, the problem with proof of stake is that proof of stake is a simulation of the universe or an imaginary universe. You're imagining energy and you're, imag you're cutting a virtual machine. They literally call it a virtual machine. A virtual machine with virtual energy in the form of virtual tokens for virtual security, all uh, manifested in software code. Proof of work um, allows you to place the consensus and the security and the integrity of the network in the hands of Bitcoin miners and Bitcoin node runners. So you're using electricity and you're using 256 ASICs in order to create the security and the integrity of the network. And that's generally thermodynamically bound. And it's open and everybody can participate and anybody can cr create their own Bitcoin miner. Anybody can mine Bitcoin. Anybody can, you know, electricity is, is broadly found in the universe. And you're not waiting. You don't need the permission of anybody to allow you to get on the network and mine. As soon as you decide that you want to get rid of 
the energy, then you've decided to create a virtual machine, virtual energy. And, and when they, when they create the energy in a proof of stake network or, you know, any other non energy protocol, you're not just getting rid of the electricity. You're also getting rid of the material energy, which is the Shaw 256 mining ASIC. So the application specific integrated circuit is matter. The electricity is energy. You're eliminating the matter and the energy. Mm. And the hardware is important here, mm -hmm. just as important as, as is the, the energy, because, because the electricity is a commodity, whereas the thing that creates, uh, that makes this a specialty or makes it a scarcity is the fact that you're, uh, you're modulating the energy through a SHA-256 mining chip. The genius of the Bitcoin protocol is that the hardware is proprietary. There is no other use for it, and it gets exponentially better over time. Such that the energy efficiency of the network is improving with Moore's law and with the having protocol so that makes this a uh, an increasingly efficient security protocol, and um, and it it protects the protocol from someone that has a huge amount of commodity computing power mm -hmm. or a huge amount of electricity power. It doesn't matter that you build a fusion reactor that generates thousands of terawatts because it's not the pure electricity that um, that secures the network. It's the um, encrypted energy. It's the SHA-256 hashes that secure the network. So if it was only the electricity, it would be uh, it would be vulnerable to an attack from someone that harnessed the power of the sun. I think what they're missing is that the efficiency of the network is improving with Moore's law exponentially. Yes. Yeah, it's it's that's what they're missing. It's not secured by energy. It's secured by digital energy or an, an encrypted energy. And the efficiency with which that uh, encryption is taking place is improving somewhere in the range of 36 to 40 percent a year. So, you know, as of today, as far as we can see, we run the numbers. Bitcoin has taken up maybe 15 basis points of the world's energy. And it's not clear to me that it's going to grow that much more. At some point, it hits some maximum. And it actually starts to decrease because... Uh, the proprietary protocol is such that ultimately in the year 2100, it won't matter whether you have harnessed all the power of a star. It won't matter because that won't, that won't allow you to build, to create hashes.
if uh, Google and Microsoft and um, Amazon, they all decided tomorrow they're going to turn all of their um, data centers into Bitcoin mining data centers, their cost, you know, to generate a Bitcoin would probably be like a million dollars a coin, if not $10 million a coin, because they're not, they don't have ASICs, right? And the ASIC isn't, isn't thousand times, it's million times more efficient. I'm excited about this. So we're going to talk about Bitcoin theory. When I think of Bitcoin, I think this is the first digital monetary system in the history of the world. There are fires that have been unleashed into the society and they're burning and the, the effect is exothermal. It's, it's, when all the monetary energy leaps from gold to Bitcoin or when it leaps from fiat to Bitcoin, there's this phase transition and uh, and um, monetary uh, energy is energy, and money is energy. In fact, money is the highest form of energy. So if we ask the question, what is money? Money is the highest form of energy that human beings can channel. Human beings as a species prosper by channeling energy. So the theme is humans prosper by channeling energy. What's the most efficient energy network in the history of the world? Well, it's about to be Bitcoin. Um, because the challenge of humans, humanity is how do I store energy and transmit energy across time and space? You have to explain to people that sound money requires energy and it actually requires scarcity. But ultimately, uh, the crypto attack is, yeah, but we can create our own token without any energy. And it's just as good and it's just as secure. And so you really have to, you have to go the other direction, which is to make the observation that if you take the energy out of the coin, you've created a coupon. And if you take the energy out of the coin, it's not money, it's credit. And if you take the energy out of the coin, it's not a commodity, it's a security. And therefore, the only question is, how are you going to inject the energy You can't avoid putting energy into uh, the product.
if you want to create something of substance. I think the real challenge is to explain to them why uh, there's a moral hazard and, a, and an economic hazard and a technical hazard to take the energy out of the crypto network. Right? The, the economic hazard is... When the energy disappears, it's easy to spin up 10,000 copycat networks. Mm -hmm. Right. So the real problem is once you go to proof of stake, well, then what's to keep you from making copies, endless copies of, of all these networks? Because you're running on generic hardware using imaginary energy. And ultimately, the, the economic hazard is there'll be 50 and then they'll all just chew into each other's monetary premium and then there'll be, then there'll be 100, then 1,000 and, and, and the like, right? And so there's no way that it will hold value because there's no scarcity when you take the energy out of it. Um. It becomes a marketing game. You, you, you know, yeah. you can, it's yeah. really a, it's really casino chips or coupons, and you'll be limited to the value that you can create in a coupon network or a security network, which is two orders of magnitude less than a monetary network. The technical hazard to not using um, not using hardware with electricity, not using those two forms of energy, is that you have to create a simulation If you live in a universe where the laws of thermodynamics hold right there's a rate at which heat dissipates everywhere in the world, and you don't have to write a piece of software to tell Bitcoin miners how to dissipate heat, you know, and you don't have to write a piece of software to, you know, to apply gravity and apply the speed of light, right? You, you kind of get that for free. In a virtual world, you have to actually write the software to control things like speed of light and speed of sound and heat dissipation and you know and gravity and and materials coefficients and and what you find is it's not so easy for a small group of engineers to duplicate what the universe worked out over the last four billion years. Bitcoin, because it's working in the physical world, it absorbs all of the physical constants in the universe, and everything works in parallel at the speed of light. Whereas in a staking network, you have to create a simulated world where you have to simulate all these constants, and, and you have to enforce your own concept of time. That's why uh, that's why energy, uh, a la Bitcoin, is the superior approach, and maybe the only approach that we know of for solving the problem of sound money. What I'm going to do is I'm going to focus upon real estate, because I really think the interesting discussion here is how Bitcoin demonetizes real estate. You know, I tweeted this morning that, uh, that Bitcoin is property. And I think um, a lot of people are getting the idea that Bitcoin is really technology to manifest property rights to 8 billion people. Um, 
But if we look at it, per, uh, look at Bitcoin as perfected property or engineered property. But probably the most constructive thing to do is to compare Bitcoin to other forms of property and other other assets to deliver property rights. In the absence of sound money, uh, if, my, if fiat currency or the currency of any given society is not holding its purchasing power, then, uh, then rational actors, be they corporations or, uh, or individual investors or families, will tend to take uh, their weak currency or their weakening currency and they will want to invest it in some stronger asset that will be a store of value. So when the yield on savings account is zero, then there's no one thinking they're saving money at 0% interest. So now uh, long-term store of value uh, moved to a focus upon uh, stock indexes and real estate and other uh, and ETFs. Right, the classic would be I bought uh, an apartment to Airbnb or I bought a rental apartment or rental property or, uh, or I, I bought some kind of share in a REIT. And uh, that takes us uh, up to the stage where people started to notice Bitcoin. We had a spike in uh, housing prices where we're monetizing, we're basically putting a premium on housing in excess of its utility value. We had a spike in commercial real estate. We had a spike in meme stocks in, in their value. We saw extraordinary spikes in collectibles and watches and sports cars and art. So, uh, so as the central bankers were flooding the economy with excess currency, the currency is trying to find a tangible asset uh, and that will hold its value as the currency uh, debases. Bitcoin, right, is one of those assets which is now being monetized and it is rising through this chaos uh, to be the apex property asset or the, the apex monetizing asset. So I, I'm, I'm of the opinion that we're going to see um, a, a consistent demonetization of other key assets and Maybe the big four. Currency, bonds, real estate, and equity. Right? Those are the four big asset classes that have been uh, monetized by excessive money printing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to focus upon real estate. Because I really think the interesting discussion here is how Bitcoin demonetizes real estate. There's a value of real estate uh, to a utility value to someone that's using it, right? The, the true utility rental value. And then to the extent that the, that the price of the real estate is beyond that, that is the monetary premium. And there's a whole lot of commercial real estate that has a monetary premium. The way that you would know that it has a monetary premium is 
you think about all the people that have excess cash and they don't want to store it in cash. They don't, they don't have a safe bank account or a savings account to put it in. And their view is I've got to buy an investment property. Why do you even want to store your money? Why, why do you even want to be an investor, right? The only reason anybody wants to invest in anything is because they believe that the risk-free rate of return on their money is too low to keep up with inflation. So in extreme hard money environment, um, the, the average person, right, the non-expert isn't an investor. The world is full of people that are actually making investments in order to preserve their wealth, and they're doing it because of the weak money. And so one of the places they make their investments is in real estate. How does Bitcoin demonetize that? Well, I think that you just want to start from first principles and you want to ask what is property and and you can either get to pure property by taking away all the defects of real property. But let's start with real estate, real property and strip every defect away from it. So what's the first defect? Well, the warehouse has got a uh, finite life. So I say to the genie, why don't you make, uh, why don't you make the building last forever? Like literally immortal. You know, pure energy, pure, uh, pure solar energy. Like stars last a billion years. Now the second the second problem is uh, buildings are 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 uh... okay. Remember the building was worth uh, two million dollars, a hundred bitcoin. Well, is the building that's indestructible and immortal worth more or less now? Right, a little bit more. Right, maybe a lot more. But generally, uh, a building that will last forever that you can't destroy is more valuable. Now the issue is uh, the building has maintenance fees. There are all sorts of fees normally on an ordinary building and you're paying insurance, that's a maintenance fee. Well, the insurance goes away if the building is indestructible, right? the maintenance fees go away. And if the maintenance cost of the building goes away, then it's worth even more. What else draws down the, or drives down the value of the building? Property taxes. So in cyberspace, there's no property tax. If I could, if I could move the building, you know, in, into orbit around Jupiter, there'd be no property tax, right? Move the building. So now I've got an indestructible, immortal, maintenance-free building with no property tax. It's getting a bit more valuable. Now, what impairs the value of the building? Well, a limitation on who you can rent it to. The ability to uh, freely subdivide and, re uh, and recombine the, the property at any frequency makes the property more valuable. The, the other thing you want, right, with any property is you want to upgrade it over time. So 
So uh, my property would be a lot more valuable if I had the right to develop it. Now, who controls that right? Well, um, it's your neighborhood, your precinct, your city, your state controls your right. But if I had property in cyberspace, I would have no limitations on my ability to develop it. Real estate in the physical world is upgraded with tractors and machines and steel and electricity, right? And material. But what if I could uh, upgrade the property using computer chips? Right? Uh, if I look at the efficiency of a computer chip, they've improved by a factor of a million over the past 10 to 20 years. But if I look at the efficiency of construction cranes in New York City, they have not improved by a factor of a million in the past 20 years. So clearly moving into the, to the computational domain for development out of the physical domain is a way to upgrade the value of the property. And that's another really nice thing about digital property versus physical property. One definition of privacy is my property is invisible to those who would do me harm and available to my friends and family. Okay, the ultimate private property though is property that's so private that no one that can do you harm, whether they're uh, a criminal or they're a competitor. If you did have a hundred story indestructible shining building in the middle of a city, don't you think that people in the city would start staring at the building and resenting the person that owns that? I don't want to own a perfect piece of property in the middle of a city where there, are, where there are, are malefactors that would do me harm. I want the property to be in the middle of the Milky Way nebula somewhere a billion, billion years from now where no one can see it, no one can get to it, and no one will resent the fact that I have it. That is, that is what privacy is. What would you rather have? The skyscraper in the middle of uh, the capital of a hostile nation state or the equivalent skyscraper somewhere in the ether that's just as useful to you? We haven't gotten rid of all the deficiencies in property. For example, if you want to uh, buy a piece of real estate or sell a piece of real estate, if it's uh, residential, it costs you 6% coming and going. Make it possible to transfer it at zero. You know, you can, you can transfer uh, Bitcoin, uh, you know, on, on chain or, or on the lightning chain at numbers that are either, you know, anywhere from 10 basis points to one basis point. That takes me to my next, my next point. I want, uh, I want my property not to be private. I want it to be unconfiscatable. Okay, if you own a farm outside of a city and the city wants an airport, they can seize your farm by eminent domain. And maybe they'll take it for their road and maybe they'll take it for their airport. Maybe they'll take it for their public park or maybe they'll just take it because they don't like you. Well, so if, if you actually put title to the property in your head as opposed to anywhere else, then it does become unconfiscatable. I want the property not to be able to be impaired by developmental restrictions. Right? And, uh, and anything physical 
by definition can be impaired, but anything in the cyberspace, you have a decent, a decent opportunity to keep it from being impaired simply by moving it. But I, if someone offers me a better mortgage, if they offer me a mortgage at, at half the cost, but that is coming from a different nation state, I can't take that mortgage because I can't move the building. So when the property becomes flexible, it becomes possible to mortgage it to anywhere, uh, to anyone on earth or in the heavens, right? Any, any bank could become the counterpart in the mortgage. What if I wanted to mortgage it at any frequency? What if I just wanted to borrow some money for the next 30 seconds? So the ability to mortgage uh, to anyone at any frequency is an upgrade. Right? It's a, it's a very flexible piece of property and I can move it at any frequency and I, I'm in essence driving down the cost of my capital in the same way that when I rent it at any frequency, I'm driving up the yield on my asset and, and uh, that makes it a better business. Um, can I just uh, store an entire billion dollar building, you know, in the palm of my hand? What if I could store a 10,000 floor building and I could uh, wear it around my finger? In this particular case, if I can get to infinite economic density, that would be very convenient. Because if I don't have infinite economic density, when it takes you an entire city block to have, you know, a, a warehouse, well, then you run out of uh, the ability to manage that warehouse. And so this infinite density gives me a lot of flexibility uh, to manage the property however I want. So if you actually could get the universe to agree that there'll never be more than 21 million blocks of perfect property, that's the icing on the cake, right? When I, when I did everything else, I created a uh, digital property, but when I capped it at 21 million blocks, I made it digital scarcity or the ultimate scarce property. When you put a restriction on the property development, it drives up the value of all the property within the city dramatically. So here we're talking about putting a, a hard cap limit on digital property in the universe for all time. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that now, now I've got $2 million to invest do I want to own a $2 million warehouse in any city in the world? Or do I want to own 100 Bitcoin? Commercial real estate was a good idea for property preservation in the 20th century. But in the 21st century, it's an antiquated idea. And Bitcoin is the opposite of that. Whereas, uh, whereas commercial real estate peaked, you know, as for when it peaked, at, it peaked at different points in different uh, jurisdictions over the last hundred years. Um, Bitcoin is now just beginning to come into its prime. And every time a new lightning wallet is shipped, Bitcoin is upgraded. And every time a new layer three app is created, Bitcoin is upgraded. And every time a new miner comes online, Bitcoin is upgraded. And every time a new regulatory guideline is, is laid out, Bitcoin is upgraded. So Bitcoin is just continuing uh, to improve its property. Real estate is continuing to decay its property. How does it get, this get demonetized? Well, you can see that the only reason that a casual investor wouldn't 
start to shift their allocation of savings from commercial real estate to Bitcoin is they don't understand Bitcoin. If you walked up to the typical real estate investor and say, quick, give me the 18 crippling defects in your real estate. They couldn't name the 18 things I just laid out to you. And you know what? I couldn't either before I knew Bitcoin. You don't understand the defects in your property until you see perfect synthetic property or digital property. Just like you don't understand the defects in your currency until you see perfect currency. If you don't understand Bitcoin, you don't know what's wrong with gold. Right? And you don't understand wrong, what's wrong with fiat currency, really, until you understand what's right about Bitcoin. property holders. They don't understand what's wrong with their investment until they understand what perfection looks like. The 10 defects in real estate versus Bitcoin. And then you go, wow, the only thing not to like about Bitcoin is it's new and volatile. What is the negative? Uh, oftentimes people have managed to not mark their real estate to market. If you can avoid a mark to market loan on real estate, then you're in good shape. Any big property development family that went bankrupt, they normally went bankrupt because their real estate assets got marked down and their loans got called by the bank. So it's that volatility, which is the number one risk. And as Bitcoin's volatility decreases over time, the uh, loan to value ratio that you could incur uh, if you're acquiring Bitcoin will start to advance. Right now, it's a low loan to value, but it will it will grow as the volatility deteriorates. And whether or not the asset is volatile, doesn't change um, all the other strategies with regard to real estate investment. If your only strategy is I wanted to borrow money to buy real estate, well, then you're, you're going to lean toward non-volatile uh, traditional assets that your bank won't remark every day. So I, I think that um, education will cause people to gradually uh, demonetize their real estate and move it into Bitcoin. Like I, I don't want to pick which of the 500 S&P 500 companies is undervalued. Uh, I just want to park my money somewhere. So I, th I think Bitcoin there is emerging as, as the monetary index or a monetary index that you can acquire. And so it, it, it will tend to demonetize those indexes. And as those index get demonetized, if, if if a billion dollars gets pulled out of the S&P index and put into Bitcoin, then that's a billion dollars of demand for stocks of the underlying 500 companies in the S&P that goes away. So as the money gets pulled out of the indexes and the ETFs, then that will demonetize the equities of the underlying constituents. And as that happens, uh, if, some, if one of the constituents is undervalued on a standalone basis, then a professional investor will come in and they will buy that stock in order to arbitrage the difference.
Well, I mean, it, it strikes me that if you look at gold, at least half of the value of gold is the monetary premium. I mean, if people just limited their gold to uh, their gold demand to what they want to wear, then you would see a gold price, which is half to one third of what it is right now. And uh, and the remaining monetary premium would flow into digital gold, which is Bitcoin in this case. Right. So I think that there's probably 10 X the amount of monetary premium in real estate that there is in gold. And if you look at the monetary premium sitting between, you know, real estate and equity, you know, one would think that, you know, you're starting to approach a hundred trillion dollar number there. The great waste of capital or the great capital sinks in the world are all of the money trapped in bonds, trapped in, in equity indexes, and trapped in overvalued real estate. To a lesser extent, the currencies, but I really think the bonds, the real estate, and the equity and probably the bonds and the real estate, the bonds are the biggest, the real estate's the second biggest, the equity is the third biggest, but all of them are an order of magnitude more than the capital that's been trapped in the gold asset. So 100 to 200 trillion dollars, right, is kind of trapped there, depending on how you look at it. And, you know, you can work backwards to try to figure out what that means to, to Bitcoin. It, the discussion we just had on digital property was what are the 18 frictions that I want to remove from physical property to create digital property? And, and how much better would digital property, property be than physical property if it was uh, immortal and could move at the speed of light and indestructible? Humans have been struggling for millions of years, right, in order to rise uh, first to become the, you know, the apex predator in nature. We have to figure out how we can get harder, smarter, faster, and stronger. look back at Stone Age technology and you ask, how, how do we even emerge uh, from this, you know, incredible, terrifying scrum? And uh, there's just key technologies uh, that you, you decide you kind of like in a hurry, right? One of them is fire. Fire is like the prime energy network of the human race. It all started for us with channeling energy. And uh, and what is it? fire is a chain reaction, right? Where we're releasing the latent energy in matter. Mm -hmm. We're converting matter into energy, right? You're that human being, and you want to rise above the tigers and the packs of wolves and the other creatures and the snakes and the jungle. How are you going to do that? You're going to have to tap into and channel energy. Is to Satoshi, right? As fire is to Bitcoin. Mm. Bitcoin's a fire. It's a fire in cyberspace. Fire came along first. And when you think about what it means, and most people don't, they don't necessarily think very hard about it. You always had it, right? If you're an individual, what can you do with fire? Well, 
you can start by by uh, starting a fire so you don't freeze to death. I hunt with it. I cook with it. There's a you know there's a lot of biologists that make and the paleo theorists that, uh, that make a very compelling argument that that human anatomy actually evolved because we mastered fire. And when you're cooking something, you're pre-digesting it. And if you pre-digest something, not only do you increase the scope of the foods that you can consume, you also accelerate and, and you increase the efficiency with which you convert that food into calories. And if you can actually metabolize the food 10 times more efficiently, your uh, digestive tract shortens and the energy that your body expends in order to digest food can be redirected probably to your brain. Animals yeah. that don't cook food have small brains. Animals that a human being can cook food can, can have a very short digestive tract, can eat. You, 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 you channel your fire and you can light up a cave, you can light up a camp, you can light up a tent, you can line up any area. And with the scene comes communicating. A certain presumptive arrogance or ignorance amongst modern, modern men, we think that kind of everything worth doing was done in the past 2,000 years or 3,000 years. I kind of figure a hundred thousand years ago, people were doing all this stuff. They, we might not have the writings of it, but but uh, they were pretty smart. I can use it for hardening, right? I can I can cook things, right? I could I could harden the the tip of a spear, right? I can I can use it to work metals, and eventually we used it to work metals and. That ushered us into, you know, from the Stone Age to the Bronze Age to the Iron Age. If I dropped you into 100,000 BC, I don't think you would on solo chase after a bunch of stuff with four legs. I think you would start by finding a, you know, a canyon and start a fire on one end and dig a trench on the other end and let something a mastodon trip on it and break its neck. It's what makes human beings unique is, is, as far as I can see, they're the only animal that plays with fire. And... <laughs> And from the point we started to play with fire, we started to evolve at a very rapid rate. And, uh, when you've got fire, you st you know you started the fire; it's all good. But now I want you to like go back a hundred thousand years and be running around in forty-two degree temperature while it's raining on you. Human beings harnessed fire, and it made all the difference. And then along comes uh, the next set of thoughts, right? If, if you can harness fire, maybe you can develop a brain. And I think they found arrowheads that go back 100,000 years. I mean, uh, like they're, they're... You know, if you study uh, Roman history and you go back 1,000 years before Rome, they had slingers. I mean, the Balearic Islands, like Ibiza, they were very famous for slingers. I mean, people invented bullets thousands of years before guns. Hmm. <laughs> guns were just the latest idea of putting bullets together with gunpowder. Um, the lead bullets probably came along 10,000 B.C., and maybe more, maybe 100,000 BC. This is a straightforward idea. If your life depended upon it, you would figure it out. And Humanity.
humanity wouldn't be here if we hunted or defended ourselves using spears. But if you go back a million years, the adversaries were never in the same frame. If you made it this far and you were a human being, you mastered the art of, of death from above. I mean, right. you killed from a distance and nobody knew that you were there. It's not a modern invention. Not only would you stand back 50 meters or 100 meters, you would stand up. There's only two types of human beings. There's the type that figured that out, and that's your grandparents. Mm -hmm. And there's the type that were a bit sloppy about one of those things, and they didn't make it. They're gone. It's all technologies that are dominating today they're dominating because they're able to deliver force faster harder stronger but if it's got the characteristic that it can be made harder it can be made smarter it can be made stronger it can be made faster there's something compelling about it. That's why digital gold is thousands of times better than gold. A mastodon is a mastodon. They're not getting harder, faster, stronger, smarter. They're just doing what they do human beings are <laughs> but only because of innovation and so 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 missiles are just a tool but they're illustrative fire is an energy network and an energy source it's a it's a mm. battery an energy source and and you can deliver it in a certain way and then that takes us to hydraulics which is which is um power from water and water is a network and another source of energy is buoyancy right you i take uh, you ever try to pick up a 2000 pound weight and carry it on your back up a hill or just across put a 2000 pound weight on a you know on a, a carriage put it on the back of a donkey drag it on skids problem right in this particular case can't be solved with fire we can't easily burn it <laughs> on the other hand if you needed to move 2,000 pounds you put it on a barge <clears throat> you put it in the water and the water pushes back 2,000 pounds <clears throat> and I can push it with one hand oil is money they think oil is power. They think, you know, that, and, and let me tell you, oil is not, oil is not, it's not really power. It's not wealth. Water is wealth. Mm. Water, water is the key to life. If I gave you $10 billion and as much land as you wanted in the desert, you can't create life. <laughs> the pyramids got bought, built 2,000 years before Cleopatra and Caesar. Had they haul it up there? And some of the most fascinating videos I've seen on YouTube are those YouTube videos that show how they build hydraulic elevators to move a two-ton or four-ton stone up by floating it you know, up a channel to the side of a pyramid. And I totally believe that's how they did it. They actually used but understanding water and the dynamics of water. There is no cradle of civilization in the Aegean or anywhere. And I'll give you another interesting. There's a reason that that equus and the and the the equestrian class 
the, uh, were the Roman knights. The knights were the equestrian class. And what it meant in ancient Rome was the top 1% or the top, you know, 0.1%. The, the nobles of Rome were the equestrian class. What it meant to be rich and powerful was you had the right to bring a horse into the city. No. The problem is they, if they allowed anybody to bring a horse into the city, it would be so unsanitary as to render the city uninhabitable. So, Most ancient cities, if you wanted them to work, you would have to have them human powered. And now you've got this dilemma of how do you move goods around? Tell me, how do I move things around cleanly? I need a clean energy source that is not going to foul my sanitary system. It's not going to actually kill me. And of course, it's The Mediterranean is the perfect ocean no. because because you can oftentimes navigate without leaving the side of land. It's hard to get too lost. <clears throat> There's a lot of ports. Well, in 1000 AD, this was a Phoenician port. And then the Greek Empire came along and it was an Athenian port. 500 and then the Ro and then the Carthaginians kicked them out and it was Carthaginian port and then the Romans kicked them out and it was a Roman port and then after the Romans fell the Venetians took this over this Venetian port and then eventually it became a, a British port you know it's like that's the story of Malta that's the story of Corfu that's the story of you know of uh, of lots of different ports in the Mediterranean And the reason why is if you want to dominate the Mediterranean, you need to have a port within one or two days sail that you can hide in whenever the mistrals blow. And if you control that network of ports, when the weather goes bad, you go into the port and your ship doesn't get sunk. And if you don't, and you're like a week away from a port that's friendly, and the weather gets bad, you get dashed against the rocks and you just die. <laughs> to get to the Iron Age. Yeah. <laughs> and we come back to this issue of uh, <clears throat> being harder, right? And being stronger. You know, we harness that fire and we start to work metals <clears throat> and uh, we move into bronze and then we move into iron. And I think, I think um, the Roman Empire is, uh, is a great, it's a great model for uh, the way that human beings interact with technology and the way that they interact with, um, uh, with a competitive world or, and become both anti-fragile and get harder, smarter, faster, and stronger. And, and you go read Livy's History of Rome, and he, you know, he writes about the Roman Republic had 700 good years, 700 years before it even went to empire. And we start with this idea of Roman politics um, you've heard the phrase, beware the Ides of March, mm. and it refers to you know, Julius Caesar. And, and, you know, people think of it as, as uh, oh, well, that's when someone's going to kill Caesar. But it's really referring to the fact that for 700 years, the Romans got together on March 15th and had an election every year. The Romans, the Romans ha were the most organized uh, of all of the civilizations we can find in the ancient world, and that's how they grew to dominate. They, they were just organized, and 
And what the, one of their forms of organization is, and this is a thing of beauty, they're running a process where every year, March 15th, they have their election. They appoint two consuls. They appoint all their officers. The consuls then, they, they conduct about two weeks worth of uh, religious ceremonies. They all worship. They appease the gods. They're getting psyched up, right? They're, they're reminding themselves that they're unique. They're self. They raise an army. They train the army. We go from March 15th all the way through to May 1st, six weeks. <clears throat> In those six weeks, they get organized, uh, celebrate, get excited, wait for a good omen, and they're really they're really getting ready. And then the campaigning season starts, May 1st. Everybody that knows anything about Europe and the Mediterranean knows the weather gets good on May 1st. The problem before May 1st, it rains, there's storms. If you set out to sea or you set out across uh, across terrain before that time period, <clears throat> if the cold doesn't get you, the storm's going to get you or your ship's going to sink or something. It's In the history of all these wars, more people die from natural causes than they die from bullets of the enemy or, or from the enemy. So the number one danger is nature's going to kill you. So right. the Romans basically did summer campaignings. <clears throat> you know, you can't navigate the med in the mm -hmm. winter. Like e even in the modern day, it's uh, you. no one would, you know, want to go yachting in the med in the winter it's just not comfortable you get storms weather is very un, uncertain and so the political system had a it had a certain elegance to it because it was tied to the calendar it was tied to nature it was a natural cycle and it took into account the need of uh, of human beings to celebrate each other's successes I go campaign, I come back, I get a triumph. It took into account their need to have a, a common faith. Common faith, you know? The faith is critical. If we're not all Romans and if we don't all believe the same thing, why are we going to die for each other? Right. the roman way and then they also took into account human motivation which is everybody's got an ego everybody needs their turn nobody can hog all the power so even if you were the greatest general this year you got to give it up to someone else next year hmm. and as long as they kept turning up and if, if i'm the second most powerful family and you're from the most powerful family Maybe I'll support you for console with an understanding that it's my turn next year. Right. As Charles de Gaulle said, right, graveyards are full of the tombstones of indispensable men. But the point is, when you know that everybody's watching you, and that you can be replaced and will be replaced next year and your future is uncertain. It brings out a higher degree of professionalism. And that's the competition in the market. Just so a whole new level. The Romans manufactured, you know, ballista and they manufactured catapults and they manufactured every sword to be the same length, every shield to be the same size. Every, every soldier took the same step, the same length. Everything was the same. You could be an eight foot tall Goliath and the Roman five foot, 10 inch tall, normal dude, right? Is going to beat the crap out of you because you're not going to get within 12 feet of him because you're going to take a spear in the gut from the 12 guys standing to his left and his right as you charge. Mm -hmm. no. Right. It's not that the Romans invented everything. 
It's just the Romans stole every good idea from every civilization, from the Greeks, from the Carthaginians, from the whatever that they crushed. And, and uh, because they lasted, <clears throat> we're able to read their histories. But, right. you know, it, it kind of blows your mind when you think that in five hundred. By the way, you think the Carthaginians invented that? Maybe they stole it from the Phoenicians. Hundred BC. If you want to win wars, you don't just make ships, and you don't just train hard, and you don't just make, you don't make wagons, right? Roman roads. <clears throat> the Romans had standardized parts, a standardized gauge for a wagon wheel. Every Roman wagon rolling on the road is carving ruts in the road. Those people that believe, you know, that that recoil in standardization well that roman uh that roman wagon gauge eventually became the standard width of a railroad track in europe and then eventually the standard width of a railroad track everywhere so if you want to know how wide a roman chariot was or war chariot or any chariot just go stand on a railroad anywhere on earth. The Romans gave that to you. And the reason why they did it that way is because if you build wagons with different gauges, they fall in the rut, they snap the axle, and that's death. Yeah. By the way, it's not that every civilization figured this out. It's just that every civilization that insisted, insisted upon doing it a different way with different bells and whistles got crushed to death. Right. Those, yeah, those roads <clears throat> were the logistics network of the Roman Empire. And if you can move goods and services, if you can move armies faster inside your borders, <clears throat> then your enemies can move inside their borders, right? Then you're going to win, right? If everybody lays down a railroad track that's, uh, that's a certain width and you come up with an idea for a car that's got a different width, who are you going to sell it to? Right. The... People talk about protocols being important, right? Well, the TCPIP wasn't the first protocol. You know, Roman roads probably weren't the first protocol either. But the point is, protocols matter. And but, um, the Egyptians had protocols to build those pyramids. You know, mm -hmm. Standard size and standard widths and standard weights and measures. Um, those protocols matter uh, uh, a heck of a lot. And uh, if you don't have them, it's impossible for people to cooperate. So money, we've talked about money a lot as, as being essential for civilization to cooperate and allowing us to uh, allowing us to specialize. But all these, uh, all these other logistics protocols or military protocols or in their own way, equally important. The Romans, the Romans understood the, the importance of hydraulics, and they took it to a new level. Um, they actually, they actually uh, created aqueducts that would bring water from up to seventy miles away to a given city. There are a lot of coastal towns on the Med that are not inhabitable. I mean the. the the natural economic density is really a function of the amount of water per year. So, so uh, if the amount of water per year is based on rainwater, maybe you can have 500 people live in the city. And if you bring the aqueduct, it goes to 5,000 or 50,000.
And so the, the, the economic density requires the hydraulic flow uh, for sanitation and, and uh, just to keep everybody alive. And uh, <clears throat> So engineering the roads, engineering the aqueducts, it's, uh, it's the rails upon which the entire Iron Age civilization was built. And Romans, if anything, they're engineers. And they elevated engineering above all. <laughs> and... Uh, A pottery wheel for 5,000 years nobody in the entire continent thought to take the wheel and turn it this way <laughs> and roll it right like they knew a wheel they knew a wheel was useful yeah I give you the wheel Robert but they never invented the wheelbarrow. They never invented the wagon. There's no rolling stock anywhere in America. You know, and so you're like, th think about the consequences of that insight. Like, how is it possible that not a single person in the entire continent ever thought they might want to turn the wheel this way? Up. Right, but it's such a profound idea. Right, and, yet, and the blockchain and Bitcoin is a wheel. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's uh, I can use this stuff if I turn it this way. You know, it's I I take a couple of. They're not complicated ideas, you know, public. You know, when you look at the classic guns, germs, and steel type narratives, like the Europeans, they got hardened and tougher because they were always fighting with each other. And living with your animals made you tougher. And having people come through from Asia made you tougher. And in the absence of all those those orderly rules, then, then you... Um, you have just a degradation of the human condition. And we started to crawl out with the Renaissance and, you know, if you look at all the great cities in the world, all the great cities grew as nexus, as the central node of an empire. So, Rome was the nexus of an empire. Carthage was the nexus of an empire. When they lose their empire, they collapse. The only way you generate enough money to make a great city is you have to scrape a tax off of all the energy, all the commercial value in a large place. A fisherman cast a wide net to capture the fish. That's your empire. The Roman, the, the Roman shtick was, you know, pay us 10% when it comes into Rome and 10% when it goes into the next port. And we'll take 20% of the value added or maybe 30% or whatever we're going to take, right? Um. If you go into Venice and you look around the Grand Canal, you see all these palazzos. They're all just uh, warehouses. I bring a ship into Venice. I offload my cargo, and then it goes out the back, and it gets barged up and down the canal, and it gets transshipped to a new ship. In that world, each ship ran this route. Venice to Alexandria was one trade route. Venice to Rome is another trade route. Venice to Istanbul is another trade route. You're, you're at the nexus. You're running these shipping networks. 
And of course, you got to bribe the guy in Istanbul, or maybe you know your son marries his daughter, and that's how that's how you get to come in and out of Istanbul without getting murdered or getting your stuff stolen. And, you know, and eventually, all the families in Venice intermarry. Like, you know, I know you; you're my second cousin. That's how we don't cheat each other. Mm. And um, there's no way. You can't solve the traveling salesman problem. There's no way I can take a ship from Istanbul to Alexandria, to Venice, <clears throat> to Rome. This, I would basically get overtaxed or extorted in each port unless I actually was, you know, friendly, right? Right, right. The way that works is you have a hub and spoke system and um, there's always one central city and there's always one set of families or companies and they intermarry and they trust each other and they just agree, I'm going to buy wheat for a nickel or, or for a dime in Alexandria. I'm going to bring it to Venice and I'm going to sell it to you for 50 cents. It's the people at the center of the network that are actually getting 10, 20, 30, 50% of all the commerce, right. all, which is all the energy. Now, and what's the definition of a smuggler or, you know, that, or a pirate? The right. definition of a smuggler is someone that doesn't want to give me half their stuff. Right. So I stop that. I have to have a navy that goes to kill them. Yep. So, so you have the Carthaginian navy stopping smuggling so they can tax half the stuff. And that's Chicago, Delinda, Est. Carthage must be destroyed. Why? <laughs> because two people can't shake down the same guy of half his stuff. There's nothing left. If I take half your stuff as a tax, I can't, you know, it's like the tax wars. Yeah, yeah. The Spaniards are taxing the shippers and the Romans want the money. So, therefore, the Romans must defeat the Carthaginians. Now the Romans tax you, then they fall, and the Venetians rise. Now the Venetian Navy controls the Med. Then you've got, uh, you know, you ever go to Venice, there's this great... Um, renaissance uh, painting the battle of lepanto and the battle of lepanto is when the king of spain allies with the pope from rome the head of the roman catholic church and with the doge of venice and, and those three navies fight the uh turks the 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 invading muslims from istanbul and they beat them and, and it's the triumph of Christendom. But it gets you thinking about why, did, why were they all killing each other in the first place over the Med? And you realize it's because they're fighting over control of the mercantile network. You've heard the name, the word Roman Catholic Church, right? Mm. You ever heard the phrase Venetian Catholic? when the Venetians terminated the Catholic Church in Venice. The Catholic Church in the entire Venetian Empire didn't terminate with, with the Pope in Rome. It terminated with the Doge in Venice. And, mm -hmm. and so that means all tithes, right, all do, goes to Venice and stops. You can't have an empire unless the person at the top of the empire is also in control of the religion. Because if you don't control the religion, then someone else takes half your money. You see, mm. it's, all, it's all about energy flow. Pontifex Maximus originally refers uh, to, the, to the Roman consul. 
to the head of Rome, right? Hmm. Augustus Caesar was the Pontifex Maximus. So the Romans had it eventually the, um, the high priest. Right. So the high priest, uh, the, the Roman consuls were the high priest of Rome for 700 years. If you're elected general, you're also the priest. You run all the religious ceremonies. When did Venice start to decline? When they lost control of the, of the church. At the end of the day, they start sinking because you can't afford to maintain those buildings. You know, you can't afford to maintain 100-story buildings in Manhattan unless you're at the center of a financial empire. Now, there are a lot of securities in, on Wall Street where there's only two market makers. There's the one bank and the other bank, and they trade with each other. And if you're buying, you're buying at the bottom, or you're buying at the top of the spread, and you're selling at the bottom of the spread, and the spread is 2%, Robert. And so if I turn <laughs> over a billion dollars worth of bonds, I'm paying $20 million in commissions, and there's a monopoly there. And the $20 million is just flowing into what? It's flowing into the building. By the way, if you go to Amsterdam, Amsterdam is the city of canals. It's a big mm -hmm. distribution. If you've ever seen a distribution center, mm -hmm. Amsterdam's that, but it's that <clears throat> for barges before we had machines. That's what Venice is. That's what every, that's what every great mercantile, that's what uh, they did in every mercantile center. Mm -hmm. And when you get to, to, you know, Martin Luther's time, you realize one of the key drivers is there's there's no way that we can rise uh, or, or elevate our civilization if we have to send all of our money to Rome. Right, right, right. You see this struggle with, throughout medieval history. William the Conqueror had that struggle. You see the struggle of the of the northern Europe, uh, northern European uh, German nobles, and then of course it punctuates itself with Henry VIII, who eventually forms the Anglican Church, so he can be the Pontifex Maximus, and, and if uh, the church terminates with the King of England, they don't have to ship any money, you know, down to Italy, nor do they have to ask permission to, to change their alliances and get married and do what they will. Well, it's useful to have God on your side. It's always <laughs> been useful. Right. And so that drives a lot of stuff throughout the Renaissance. And it drives the, you know, you can say, you can say that Northern Europe broke off from the Roman Catholic church for religious reasons, or you could say, the Northern European powers to be created the religion for political mm. reasons to, and economic reasons. The church, but either way, you know, it's, it's kind of a triumph of history that everybody's forgotten that there used to be lots of, why do they call it Roman Catholic if there weren't other Catholics? How many different branches of the Catholic Church do you think there were? Like a thousand. <laughs> there could have been a lot. They just kind of coalesced over time. But here's the general principle. Everywhere on earth where you see a big city, it was the center of an empire. Paris, London, Hong Kong, New York, Venice, Rome. Everywhere. You, and by the way, everywhere where you see a city that's fallen upon hard times, that's been destroyed, its empire lapsed. And now the question is, what are the empires of the future? Uh, where do they form? 
And that takes us really to the steel age, you know, the 19th century, the, the robber barons and the like. And you can see with shipping networks, you know, those canals gave way to free ports and eventually gave way to container ships. And container ships totally <laughs> remade everything, and they and they shifted power to Singapore and Hong Kong and companies like Maersk. And, and uh, ultimately, it's a low energy. Uh, it's a componentized way to move things around. The most efficient way to move anything on Earth <clears throat> is modern containers. Why? Put all your stuff in a container ship, and the container goes on to a ship. They've got standard loading facilities into a port. They've got standard um, standard train cars and standard trucks, everything right. standardized. I guess, yeah, traditional empires are producing security. The number one export of the United States is security. Like literally, <clears throat> I can... I can live in Miami Beach and I don't worry about someone shooting me across. They they have that saying about Genghis Khan. They said when uh, the Mongols controlled all of Asia, a virgin could have ridden from one end of the empire to the other with a pot of gold on her head and not be molested. <laughs> The Mongols weren't screwing around either. Yeah. <laughs> you, you intercept their mail. If anybody get anything gets stolen, anybody gets hurt, they show up with an with an army and they murder everybody for a hundred miles in every direction, kind of to make the point: don't f with the system. Right. right. <clears throat> now, uh, most of these empires, they generally provide this kind of security for their citizens. You know, <laughs> not always for the non-citizens or the aliens or the slaves or the whatever. Who Bitcoin is a security and Bitcoin's number one, it's number one uh, value proposition is security. It's, it's security of, of uh, energy, right? If, if energy is, translated to money and money is translated to Bitcoin and it's stored in the Bitcoin network, <clears throat> you're securitizing your assets, you know, in a cloud of behind a wall of encrypted energy. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, in that regard, <clears throat> it provides an important right and empowerment to the individual. Uh, Nazi Germany in the 30s all the Jews had their money locked up in Germany and so the way the system worked is is they operated as bankers and they allowed people to uh, launder their money out of Germany and they would take a haircut 10, 20, 30 percent initially then 50 percent then 70 percent then 90 percent until So consequently, um, people didn't want to leave. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if you, if you, if you don't have your monetary power or your assets secured virtually, then your physical security is always at risk because you can't leave, nor can you protect yourself. Right. You can't you can't pay for anything to protect yourself, and you can't get out, or you can't pay to get out. You know, one of the most useful, or common, or, or not common, one of the compelling use cases of Bitcoin would be if I'm a refugee trying to flee a war zone, because it's either that or gold, and the problem with gold is there's a lot of people with guns. They're going to take it from you. Yep. And at least with uh, Bitcoin, you could pay the guy with the gun half the money when you started and the other half when you got there. 
And the worst he can do is blow your head off, but he's not getting your money. Whereas if you got gold, he just blows your head off, takes the gold. Yep. If we uh, if we think about the steel age, <clears throat> these rail networks are, are 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 another network to deliver deliver um, energy faster, stronger smarter, harder. Of course, at the, at the nexus of every transportation hub, there's an economic center. So railheads, <clears throat> if the great city isn't a port, it's at the center of a railroad juncture. Mm-hmm. And when you bring in, a lot of times, sometimes they, at the center of the rail juncture, you can tax all the trains. So if, if uh, goods come from Spain into Paris and they're going to Germany, the French get to take a tax right there in Paris. So the rail heads became a, a nexus. The other fascinating thing about the railroads is they became really instrumental to logistics movement of armies and, and they drove economic and political power But it's a reminder that a lot of times the difference between winning and losing and living and dying is D of railroads. The continent, right? The Union Pacific Railroad. And <clears throat> once the railroad crossed the continent, you know, it's a manifest destiny. Mm-hmm. The United States was going to dominate without that railroad. Was it a thousand times more expensive to move stuff over land? Right, the right, right. Yeah. Like a, You know, Google is, um, they're very good at saying, we don't do anything else that's going to be 10x or 100x better. I mean, so that's a Silicon Valley trope. You know, mm-hmm. don't bother to do it unless you're going to have a breakthrough that's 100x. And well, all these things were 100x better, but mm-hmm. a railroad we take for granted could be, I give you five tons of stuff, carry it from New York to California count the amount of energy it's going to take you now put it on a railroad car try again all right you think that's not faster and stronger <laughs> and that takes us to john d rockefeller right <clears throat> before standard oil comes along people are actually hunting whales they're getting in wooden ships chasing around right. the indian ocean to kill a whale boil down its blubber make kerosene and burn a lamp yeah. Not a very efficient way to gather energy. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, so then along comes oil, and oil is a thousand times more efficient way to get energy. And what standard oil was, was <clears throat> it was first an energy producer, but it was also an energy storage device. It's a battery, right? Because the best way to store energy is put it in a tank. It was also an energy network. Uh, Standard Oil, they bought up all the, they didn't actually buy the fields, they bought the refineries. They refined the oil, they stored the oil, they bought up all the tanker cars, they bought up all the tanker ships, they locked down all of the networks, and they basically had an energy network. They actually had guys driving around with carriages to deliver you know, their energy to every single retail store. They had retail distribution. They would even give away the furnaces to sell the energy. They did a Jeff Bezos mm-hmm. thing, you know. Amazon Prime. People think Jeff Bezos invented it. He didn't invent it. I mean, if you read the, you know, the biography of John D. Rockefeller, <clears throat> Rockefeller invented it all. Like he, he did it all. He gave away... You know, the razors to sell the razor blades. He's the first guy to realize that, by the way, that you have to form a cartel or you have to form some kind of understanding of scarcity. If there's no scarcity, there's so much volatility. So 
you had the world's first serious energy network there. And it's such a powerful network that 100 years after Rockefeller's dead, those companies still are worth a trillion dollars, right? You talk about scarcity. The problem of using a commodity as money is when the price goes up, people produce too much of it. Right. So he, he, it was a very inefficient industry with massive volatility. <clears throat> And so he consolidated it to drop the volatility so that they could standardize every component along the way. Mm, interesting. <clears throat> so, uh, so that he could drive to a lower energy level. Right? I mean, a more, efficient, a more efficient energy system. Like if, if you calculate, you know, no. the value of all of your human effort in, in uh, modern energy costs, a quarter. And you think about where we got to and we got through to that uh, by channeling this energy. <clears throat> and uh, it, it must be again, it's a thousand X, 10,000 X more right. energy. In fact, um, just a general theme you see everywhere where there's an explosion of innovation and an explosion of vitality. Somebody tapped into a thousand X more energy or, or figured out how to deliver the energy. Oil, you know, oil was originally, it was all about uh, kerosene and lighting and then heating. And then of course the automobile shot it up by a factor of 10 and that was the killer app mm -hmm. here's an interesting one craft hershey's and uh, post cereal they're technology companies people don't think of them as that before before they came along um there was no breakfast that people to eat breakfast. Kraft and Post figured out how to box cornflakes and put it. And what they did is they stabilized food energy and put it in a container that didn't bleed the energy, that didn't leak energy. The, the origin of branding the Kraft brand, the Hershey's brand, the whatever brand. <clears throat> the origin of branding is I make some, I make it in a clean room, hermetically sealed. The number one value proposition, Robert, wasn't it's good ketchup. The number one, or, or it's good tomatoes or good soup or good whatever. The number one value proposition is it's not going to kill you. Mm. Right? You ever actually make some leftovers and leave it in your refrigerator for two months and eat it? By the way, here's a better one. Why don't you make something in your kitchen and then leave it in your closet for two months without a refrigerator? Because they didn't have refrigerators. Frozen food came along later. And Marjorie Merriweather Post became like one of the richest women of the century a, because her, her father gave her post cereal and they were able to stabilize starch in a box at room temperature. And then B, because she brought, bought a frozen, the first frozen food company and she realized the ability to actually freeze food was going to be a game changer. And before that, no one ever frozen food before. You think they're not technologists. Right. It's a food energy company. So and you, I mean, you need energy and food form, and nutritional form to not die. Yeah. Can I take electricity from Detroit and deliver it to you in San Francisco today? No. Can I deliver electricity from Detroit 
to Grand Rapids, Michigan. Yes. When it gets to you, how long can you store it in your battery? It bleeds 2% a month. Can I ship food from Detroit to Grand Rapids? Yeah. When it gets there, how long can you store it in your cellar? A day? A week? Well, if the answer is two weeks, there's no national business there. There's no national brand. The answer needs to be three months or six months. Now there's a national brand. So these guys that were launching these businesses, they were really launching clean room manufacturing plants that uh, captured energy or something of value. They, ca- they were store of value, Robert. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Both store of value that would not uh, decay or bleed due to bacterial infestation or spoilage. And because of that, the brand became important, just like the standard brand was important. The kerosene's not going to explode. It's clean, right? No. Is it gasoline <laughs> clean? Is the ketchup clean? You go to Hershey's, Pennsylvania, they got a factory. It's a work of art. If you, you know, it's more complicated than most computer programs. They wrote a computer program in steel. It's like, hmm. don't F that up, right? Like, oh. you can't, there's no version two coming. Write your program in an analog computer welded in steel that takes up a football field. That's what they did. And then one end goes like milk and eggs and, you know, and, yeah. you know, and out the other end comes like boxes of chocolate bars, 50,000 an hour. And it's not just they come out perfectly uniform it's they come out without bacteria in them and you can put them right. on a shelf and they won't make your kids sick right. yeah now with regard to businesses i would say that all of the great businesses the growth companies were all technology companies in right. their time and and eventually and, and, and almost by definition, they stop growing when they when they are no longer cutting edge technology companies, right? Mm-hmm. There are other businesses that are more like rent seeking businesses or their concessions. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. the guy that sells bottled water in the shadow of the Notre Dame Cathedral, that's a business. It relies upon political largesse, you know. Maybe, maybe there's a real estate business, right? I own that real estate and then I sell you water or lemonade on that real estate, right? There are those kind of businesses, but the growth companies, right? Standard Oil, you know, was a growth company, U.S. Steel, Boeing, IBM. In that period when they're growing, they're a technology company. D. Rockefeller was worth three hundred, four hundred million dollars in his money. Multiply it by a hundred. Yeah. Right. Multiply it by two hundred. Right. You know, he got to being worth a billion, I think. So he probably was worth two hundred billion. important at this point for us to just look at the impact of steel and aluminum through this entire era. Um, Carnegie created an empire based on steel and uh, Andrew Mellon's empire was substantially based on aluminum and the aluminum Alcoa. And um, steel is an elemental force for the civil engineering industry. And aluminum became that elemental force for aviation. 
Uh, without steel, there really there is no modern <clears throat> city. You know, you build a building in wood, it's two stories. Build a building in bricks or masonry, it's five stories as max. In order to create New York or London or any great city, you need steel and you need, of course, an elevator. <laughs> straightforward things but of the two of them steel is the harder development the elevator you can probably figure out it's a counterweight on a pulley mm. whereas <clears throat> steel is is iron laced with carbon and it's really hard how hard it's think think about how complicated it is in order to refine steel and shape steel when it's uh, molten and it melts through just about anything you might put it in or on. <laughs> so technology or not technology? Harder technology, everybody thinks they're in the technology business today. Nobody deals with technology that's as dangerous and tricky as you know, what Carnegie and those early steel uh, steel refiners are dealing with, or the DuPonts handling nitroglycerin. <laughs> like, what do you th think happens when you mishandle nitroglycerin? When you mishandle crypto, you lose some money. When you mishandle nitroglycerin, everything gets blown up again right. for half a mile in every direction. And uh, aluminum, again, not so easy either. So these, these are really difficult technologies, <clears throat> but really elemental because the difference between steel and no steel is do you build a 100-story skyscraper? Steel's the perfect material for civil engineering. It's, uh, it's cheap. It's got extraordinary tensile strength. If you if you paint it or maintain protect it from corrosion, it will last forever. Literally forever, Robert. If I if you build a steel ship and you punch a hole in it, you can weld the hole with another piece of steel, and the weld will be stronger than the original cold rolled steel. It's that strong. So in the world of strong, this is the strongest of strong materials. It's strong. It's cheap. Carnegie figured it out. They built every bridge with it. No steel, no bridges. No bridges, no Manhattan. All modern civil engineering is based on steel. So then along comes aviation and they try to build a plane with steel. What happens? You ever see a steel airplane? No. It's the no. perfect material. It's cheap. It's indestructible. Why not build an airplane with steel? A shape and aluminum is 20 times more expensive than steel, you know, and it flexes and there's also, and it's difficult to work. It doesn't matter. Steel doesn't fly. Iron doesn't fly. But you try to find a metal which is stable. That's a, that's a, that's going to be a a structurally sound metal for aviation, and aluminum's the one. No aluminum, no aviation. It's an elemental force. And, uh, and on that uh, element, you make that breakthrough, then you have hundreds, uh, you have a trillion dollar industry. Right. They, they all kind of come down to networks that move energy around. Mm -hmm. Standard oil is an energy network. The railroads are, are energy networks, right? Oh, no railroad no tanker car with energy on it, right? The railroad right. is the energy network moving the oil around. 
the airplanes, another energy network moving high frequency cargo around and information around. Mm -hmm. And uh, and each one of them, you know, build another one. And then the food networks. And the result of all of them is there are large corporations and huge, huge opportunities for wealth creation if you get to the node of the network. Mm. Is average life expectancy at 1900 is 50 in America. It was 70 under the Romans. It was 30 in the Dark Ages. It might have been 32, 33 on, in the Revolutionary War in the US. We crawl back up to 50. And, um, and then by 1950, it's 70. And so probably the most rapid expansion in the quality of life in thousands of years is in that 50 years from 1900 to 1950 because of the conquest of infectious diseases. And that's all really a function of discovering, you know, discovering the science of, of uh, microbes and sterilization, understanding that you need to be sterile. And then the second is antibiotics. And those two things together were extraordinary. Antibiotics alone and penicillin is resol responsible for the defeat of tuberculosis and tuberculosis killed a billion people. the white plague, if you caught tuberculosis, it was a death sentence. I think it killed Chopin, killed all sorts of people. Mm -hmm. um, a billion people, more than any war. And of course, in this particular case, if you look at uh, history books on the 21st, 20th century, they give it like two paragraphs. Mm -hmm. The impact of technology, of modern medicine and antibiotics and, and, and uh, networks and, and cheap energy and, and sterilization and sanitation and running water, the impact of that so dwarfs every political thing that took place in the century that what you humans triumph throughout history by channeling energy, right? That, that all of these things come down to how did I channel energy? So Navy power, right? The British, the British Navy ruled the sea, the Phoenicians, the Venetians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Americans today control the seas via their aircraft carriers and by naval power and And uh, naval power is just bringing overwhelming force to bear faster, stronger force that's faster, that's harder than any other force anywhere on earth. All empires are driven by that naval power. In time, we invented airplanes, you know, and then air power became the thing. Right. And uh, if I could get above you, and we saw this conclusion, it is impossible for a modern nation state to function if it does not control its own airspace. Working opposite. It's an energy thing, right? So I'm right. moving from a lower energy state. I'm on the ground, moving armies around to a higher energy state. I have a boat. I'm moving heavy munitions around to a higher energy state. I'm above you, dropping munitions on you. <clears throat> then after that became nuclear power, right? You harness nuclear power and that ended World War II pretty definitively in a hurry. Then we go to space satellite power and you go up in the gravity well some more and that manifests itself primarily with GPS, right? 
all, all through human history, since a million years ago to today, it's really the story of intelligent people looking around for where is the energy coming from right. and how do I channel it in a network in order to achieve something harder, smarter, faster, stronger. Clear that um, information is flowing across borders and even when people try to stop it, <clears throat> uh, they're, uh, they're defeated by VPNs and mm. anonymous browsing and, you know, Technology is empowering the individual and giving them more mm. sovereignty. That's right. And it's it's harder and harder in those ways for the government to control what information you get and then how you manage your assets. Right. Yeah, it's more and more things dematerialize the software and they uh, and they move into cyberspace. <clears throat> It seems like it, uh, it gets harder for any one government to assert control over mm. the things that, that take place virtually. You know, a lot of times you'll see an S curve where it'll start slow and then it'll accelerate until it reaches diminishing returns. And then all of a sudden it's not te an interesting technology anymore. You see that a lot. But one of the lessons of uh, history is it's very difficult to figure out when the curve starts. Mm. And um, it's hard to stop it once it starts, but it's, it's, it's a lot easier to invest in it and to uh, forecast it once it starts. But... <clears throat> Before it starts, people will say, well, next year this will commercialize or, or in two years or in five years, 10 years. You could be off by two years. You could be off by 100 years. Mm -hmm. Technology fails until it succeeds. In the year 1902, before the Wright brothers flew that next year, if you'd asked the most learned people on earth, they would have given you a hundred reasons why airplanes will never fly. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the thing about these paradigm shifts is oftentimes it's not the learned individuals that make the breakthrough. Uh, aircraft weren't designed by professors of aeronautics and astronautics and engineering and fluid dynamics and mathematicians. They all failed miserably. Right? The Wright brothers were bicycle mechanics. <laughs> they had a bicycle shop. Tinkerers. Yeah. Right? They're the ones that ushered in the age. And uh, they did it against all conventional wisdom. And on the other hand, Leonardo da Vinci tried to develop his own flying contraption. Every brilliant person for hundreds of years tried it, failed. Mm -hmm. All failed. And then some dudes in Dayton, Ohio, that have a bicycle shop succeed. Um, it happens like that, you know, the, the story of um, John Harrison inventing, uh, discovering a method to determine longitude on the ocean, which is, it's articulated in the book Longitude. It's an amazing story. Everybody knew how to find latitude. It was easy. You just sight against the North Star. But longitude is very hard because all the earth spinning all the time. and. Mm -hmm required massively complicated calculations. <laughs> they gave it to the Newtonian professors at Cambridge and Oxford, the smartest mathematicians in the world, the smartest astronomers in the world. No one could figure it out. Finally, they posted a 10,000 pound prize 
and John Harrison, who was not a mathematician, his clockmaker figured it out. And the way he figured it out is he made a clock that was accurate. Mm. And they put one clock on the this ship and they set it to the Greenwich Observatory, the Royal Observatory, which is in Greenwich, England. Hence the term Greenwich Mean Time. Greenwich uh. Mean Time comes because you sail down the Thames past the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. You set your clock on that and then you have another clock and then every day at noon, if you're in the Caribbean, you look up and then you set that clock and then you just subtract the time on the one from the time from the other multiply by 15 degrees and you've got your long, longitude. So you see lots of examples in history where people try to do something and they either accidentally discover it like penicillin or um, a tinkerer discovers it and not the educated and then all the professors crap all over it and they all swear it'll never work. And the tendency is, is either to reject it, people don't like change, or it doesn't get embraced until everybody dies or until there's a war. And war has a way of opening your mind because when someone drops a bomb on your head and you're burning or screaming, then the pain causes you to take a more open-minded attitude. So a lot yeah. of stuff happened after World War II and happens in various wars, and you can trace it throughout human history. That drives innovation faster. You know, generational change will drive it faster. <clears throat> People keep trying it, and then just because it's failed a thousand times doesn't mean it won't succeed, but when it does succeed, then it's probably unstoppable for a while. Arthur C. Clarke writes, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Yeah. Thousands and thousands of examples of magic things in our lives today, <laughs> literally magic things that are just technical things. It's always been that way and, and, and to a to a primitive man, right, a rifle looks magical. Or an airplane. And now we're starting to deal with, uh, with some software technologies and digital technologies that don't just look magical to a primitive man. They're going to look magical to a modern man. Right. <laughs>